and I am delighted to be here on behalf of the University of Illinois Center for Advanced Study to welcome you to this virtual George Miller Khan event. This afternoon, Joan B. Rose, Professor of Microbiology and Molecular Genetics, and Homer Nolan Chair in Water Research, Department of Fisheries and Wildlife at Michigan State, will be speaking to us about how molecular tools and metagenomics can facilitate the identification of human viral pathogens, including the global spread of diseases like COVID-19. But first, let me acknowledge that our institution is on the lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piankasha, Wea, Miami, Muscoutin, Ottawa, Sauk, Muskokwe, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw nations. These lands were the traditional territory of these nations prior to their forced removal. And these lands continue to carry the stories of these nations and their struggles for survival and identity. And as a land grant institution, the University of Illinois has a responsibility to acknowledge the peoples of these lands, as well as the histories of dispossession that enabled the growth of this institution for the past 150 years. So I invite us to reflect on and address um, these histories and the role that this university has played in shaping them. This acknowledgement and the centering of native peoples is a start as we move forward. And second, it is my honor to tell you just a tiny bit about Jordan Miller, the man who along with our range of co-sponsors makes these events possible. Born in 1863, George Miller received his PhD in 1893 from Cumberland University in Tennessee. Um, he was on the faculty at Michigan, at Cornell, uh, and at Stanford before coming to Illinois. And he was the author of more than 20 publications. He was a specialist in the theory of finite groups. At one point, he was the president of the Mathematics Association of America. He was devoted to this university and to the field of mathematics. And he was a very quiet and unassuming man. But when he died in 1951, he left an estate of almost a million dollars to the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And he said to have remarked that everything I have, I received from this university and I simply want to repay my obligation. And we are so very grateful for his generosity. So the hallmark of a Cass Miller Com event whether lecture or performance, is its broad appeal across the disciplines. And I know that you will find this is clearly demonstrated today. There could hardly be a more timely issue to be talking about. Um, so ne let me now hand over the mic to Professor of English and Associate Director for Education and Outreach at the Institute for Sustainability, Energy and Environment, uh, Gillen Wood, who will be introducing Professor Rose for us today. Thank you, Gillen. Thanks so much, Tamara. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and a special thanks to the Center for Advanced Studies for sponsoring this Millicom lecture. Uh, as most of you know, uh, this event is part of the spring 2021 IC Jacks Congress, the future of water. Now I'm Gillan Wood, the Associate Director for Education and Outreach at the Institute for Sustainability, Energy and Environment. And our spring Congress, which appropriately coincides with Earth Month has been an exciting opportunity for us to all join in a conversation on the grand challenge of, of, of global water quality and water security. Water is not only a basic human need and right, it also serves as a critical input for energy and agriculture and ecosystem services, which in turn affect human livelihoods and well-being. Now, climate change in particular is leading to increased hydrologic variability with a significant impact on the hydrologic cycle water availability and water demand at the global, regional and local levels. And a key dimension of the water challenges we face intersect with issues of social justice, how marginalized communities have historically and continue to be denied proper access to fresh water and sanitation. Now, these are just a few of the threads of the ongoing interdisciplinary conversation on water at the University of Illinois, which I see is giving special focus to this Earth Month. Now, before I introduce today's keynote speaker, I want to thank our Congress partners. I see was so grateful to partner this year with the Joint Area Centers, three of which are funded through the US Department of Education Title VI grants, and with the Illinois Global Institute. 
Uh, I see JAX and IGI are all passionately aware that it's high time to readdress the, the topic of the global water crises and we're excited to enter into this partnership. We're also proud to announce that this keynote and the Congress 2021 lecture series as a whole is certified green in accordance with IC certified green events program. Please take a look at the slide on your screen to read a bit more about the program. Now I'd like to introduce our final Congress keynote speaker, Dr. Joan Rose, who will present her lecture from polio to COVID, environmental virology at its best. Now, Professor Rose has spent her career uh, studying water quality, water treatment and reclamation and tracking pathogens in water from E. coli to the COVID-19 virus. Now her work has had a major impact on community health and the scholarship on community health the world over. She is uh, the Homer Nowland Chair in Water Research at Michigan State University. She's the leader of the Global Water Pathogens Project in partnership with UNESCO and serves on the EPA Science Advisory Board for the Great Lakes. She is also the 2016 recipient of the prestigious Stockholm Water Prize and a citizen of Singapore for her contributions to water quality and security in that nation. Uh, she's published more than uh, 300 articles in her long and distinguished career. Today, she's here to discuss the past and present water crises involving viruses in wastewater, freshwater and the oceans, and how new monitoring technologies will help mitigate the dangers caused by these pathogens to help us meet global grand, grand challenges in water security and public health. So please join me in a virtual welcome for Dr. Joan Rose. Well, thank you so much, um, you know, Professor Wood and, um, and uh, Professor Chaplin for those introductory words. And uh, I was quite, you know, touched by the diversity, you know, that the land, the, the diversity of the, the native population that was here as you spoke, um, Professor Chaplin and that whole diversity and how important that is to us now. Um, any rate, it's a pleasure to be here to be thinking, uh, you know, about water and especially uh, as we uh, refocus our, our attentions on the environment uh, during this week and, and uh, during Earth Day. So I'm going to share my screen. And without further ado, get um, going. Let's see, I think I'll leave that so I can see the screen myself. All right, so I was trained as an environmental virologist um, early in the 80s. And uh, I guess I could never have dreamed um, the evolution of what was going to, to take place in the last 20 some years. Um, all right, let's see. Okay, I'm not moving the screen, so I am going to redo this. We'll try again. Ah, brilliant. So, you know, we now know that um, viruses um, are, you know, infect every other living entity. They're obligate, um, you know, uh, entities and they only rep replicate within their host. Um, and so, uh, you know, bacteria have viruses. So we've got bacteriophage, um, algae have viruses, all animals, fish, birds, and mammals have viruses. And the virus group that we normally looked at, those of us that looked at environmental health or, or health related water microbiology was a, a list of, of a growing list of, of about a hundred different viruses, which we called enteric viruses. You can see them here on this list. Some of the key ones, adenos, coxsackie, echoes, enteroviruses, hepatitis A, noro, of course, poliovirus and rotavirus. We, we, often thought about how um, you know, host-specific viruses were. Um, but now we know they're jumping around. And of course, the, the coronaviruses are no exception. 
Um, and, and we're learning something new all the time about how viruses, if they can attach um, to a cell, can enter and maybe uh, replicate within that cell and then cause harms. You know, viruses are nanoparticles. They're biological nanoparticles, so they're small. When they're in the environment, they're quite inert, but they're quite stable. And, and so their transmission through the environment, especially some of these enteric viruses, um, has been uh, well studied. Now, if we look back in history, really, in the study of viruses, it's, it's really at the intersection of understanding the health of, of humans and animals, um, of course, the science piece, but technology that's allowed us to explore these um, small entities uh, that are able to go uh, into a cell and replicate and take over. Um, we, we know of uh, early uh, description of viral diseases uh, well before we actually understood what a virus was or, or filterable agent. So we've had a description of, of viruses which caused something similar to polio virus and uh, from the 1700s. Um, we knew about vector-borne viruses such as yellow fever, we knew they were filterable agents. We knew they were contagious. Um, and, and in fact, it, it, there was a, an understanding early in the 1900s about trying to develop a vaccine for these infectious entities um, uh, as a way to prevent uh, the disease. And of course, we had to figure out how to culture viruses. Um, we were culturing them in, in animal populations, but then we developed cell cultures so that we could study these viruses. And of course, the, the, the study of bacteriophage um, really led uh, the way to understanding, uh, you know, molecular mechanisms uh, of replication and DNA and RNA. Um, so all of this technology and science has come together. Um, it wasn't even until the 1950s, though, that we were able to actually see a virus under the electron microscope as it was invented. And of course, by 1985, the polymerase chain reaction, which is a technique in which we can replicate pieces and, and hone in on, on pieces of nucleic acid, uh, really expanded our view of uh, this group of, um, uh, you know, this global group of, of viruses in the world. Um, you know, this, this history of disease with viruses goes back and in particular with things like hepatitis viruses, because we knew about jaundice and liver disease and, 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 and found out that, that it was contagious. And uh, most of the records are actually in, um, you know, in the military, they're, they're kept in, in books and, and records because people kept track of these events and they would write up some of these, um, some of this literature. And so it was quite recognized that this epidemics of, of jaundice um, could occur in military troops. And of course it was written up in the civil war and, and was prominent in the first world war. Um, by the 1940s, you know, the, this jaundice was actually named infectious hepatitis. And in 1973, the virus was first detected. That doesn't actually seem that long ago, really. It was first detected under the electron microscope. Now, hepatitis A is sort of an iconic virus, virus one of our enterics that spread through the fecal oral route. It's a virus, uh, like many viruses, that uh, replicates in a primary location, the intestinal tract, but then can spread to other organs in the body and, and cause various types of disease. Uh, we still have hepatitis A that is a very widespread despite having a vaccine. And I think this whole discussion about vaccination and prevention of viral infections is going to continue uh, you know, to um, uh, be brought forward, both in the general population as well as in, in our, our, our own science spheres. Um, and it really took decades uh, for us to understand immunology and the way to develop um, safe uh, you know, vaccinations. And really vaccinations for hepatitis A was not readily available until you know, um, this, uh, the 21st century uh, where we now have this, this vaccine, but it's still not widely uptaken. Um, 
And, uh, you know, I think Michigan <laughs> even um, started thinking about, wow, what's going on with this, these enteric viruses? You know, we, they end up in, you know, our feces, they're, they're transmitted through fecal oral uh, transmission routes. They're transmitted through food, contaminated food and contaminated water. And despite having a vaccine just recently, um, uh, the hepatitis A, which had been coming down um, in the United States, started spiking back up. And it was particularly affecting the homeless. And it actually started in California in the West. And it spread all the way through the United States within a year. And in fact, Michigan was quite was hit quite hard. Populations in Michigan was hit were hit quite hard with hepatitis A, uh, several big outbreaks, and of course deaths associated with with these infections. Um, and the environmental virology world um, and one of my colleagues, um, uh, Dr. Irene Zargaraki. Um, was actually watching wastewater for these enteric pathogens, and in particular, trying to understand the spread and, in the community of hepatitis of the hepatitis A virus um, uh, as it came through. So, watching wastewater for many of these viruses was not uh, anything new for us. Polio virus is another iconic virus. Um, it has a long history. Uh, it was depicted as a, a disease in paintings and Sir Walter Scott had a very uh, large description of the, of the disease and the, the paralytic um, uh, impacts. And uh, it was actually called infantile um, uh, paralytic disease early on. And uh, early in the 1900s, so epidemics, that is unusual cases of outbreaks were springing up. Uh, both in Europe and the United States. And um, it was determined that this, this very odd disease where you became paralyzed was actually contagious, was an infectious agent. Um, by the 30s and 40s, they were using primates to study the virus and to grow the virus, but cold, uh, cell culture came along, as already mentioned, uh, by the 1950s. Uh, in the 40s, it was identified that this was a virus where its primary site of replication was in the intestinal tract. And, and so it was, it was spread by the fecal oral route. It replicated the intestinal tract and um, then spread to other uh, parts of the body to cause some of the disease. And of course, the early vaccines were, were these oral vaccine vaccinations uh, that were, um, you know, where there was global, uh, obviously global approach to try to eradicate this disease. Um, so there has been a global um, network developed for polio virus. Um, it is one of those uh, viruses the world has uh, tried to address. And um, it really has uh, brought together not only virologists, but epidemiologists and clinicians, and of course, national programs uh, designed to look at immunization and really use vaccination as a way to eradicate the disease. Um, the Global Polio Laboratory Network was really established in 1990, not that long ago by the World Health Organization and, and various national governments. And um, it, it, early on, you know, this was a live vaccine that was used. We also have a, a killed vaccine, but that means that the live vaccine means that we can actually monitor for and, and distinguish using genetic tools, um, the, the genetic, uh, the, the vaccine strain from the wild type. Um, the network now has 146 accredited laboratories in 92 countries and in six regions of the world. Um, and, and, and so any kind of eradication globally of a disease is just a huge right uh, undertaking and effort. And we're seeing the, um, the huge effort that, that the uh, global community is, is, is uh, harnessing to look at this at SARS, this recent COVID. Now, um, we have now um, pretty much eradicated polio virus from most of the world. Um, we still do see, of course, the vaccine and the vaccine strain does cause 
So the wild type of polio virus you can see, but we can also see some vaccine derived polio cases. So the vaccine itself has a little bit of risk. And so they've been able to monitor and focus in on those parts of the world um, uh, where um, the, the uh, effort really needs to be beefed up uh, for vaccination and for surveillance. Um, and you can see this in Africa and parts of Asia. Um, and while it's been eradicated, um, we still have um, the disease existing. We've seen some outbreaks, particularly in Afghanistan and, and Pakistan. And sewage surveillance it was still uh, highlighted um, early on as a way to monitor the community infection, the, um, the potential spread of the disease and the uptake of the vaccine program, the success of the vaccine program. So this was highlighted back in, in 2018. Now, um, it was already mentioned by Professor Wood, I mean that, you know, uh, the Millennium Development Goals and the Sustainable Development Goals now have really um, developed a focus on water, the SDG six, and uh, in particular access to sanitation, treatment of our waste, uh, safe handling of our wastewater, reuse, uh, recycling, and recovery. All of these are goals uh, now within the Sustainable Development Goal. Um, and and we've not done such a good job on the sanitation side. I mentioned that I got my, uh, you know, I started in this field in the 80s. And at that time, uh, you know, they were just starting to look at whether we could upgrade the way we handle wastewater um, and upgrade it to more treatment and more reuse um, uh, throughout uh, the world. At that time, the World Bank funded um, a series of scientists around the world to produce a, a um, sort of the Bible, which I grew up with, on sanitation and disease, and the way that we might um, manage excreta and wastewater uh, safely. Um, uh, this book was just recently redone by the Global Water Pathogens Project. The GWPP started in uh, about 2014. Um, they decided to redo this, this book but uh, with an online accessible platform. So we now have a book on sanitation and disease in the 21st century. Of course, new viruses and new pathogens have, been, have emerged, um, you know, rotavirus, norovirus, um, uh, weren't in the original book. Um, we still have, the, of course, cholera and typhoid, and the iconic uh, bacteria that we're concerned with. Um, but we've got Arcobacter and, and, and new pathogens emerging. And of course, we've got the protozoa, Cryptosporidium giardia, Intamoeba, and the Helmus, the, the worms. Uh, and, and, uh, and so these four groups are highlighted um, in terms of, of, of managing sanitation. Um, this platform is open. Um, it's publicly open and you can and download the various chapters. Um, at waterpathogens.org. Uh, um, this is uh, over 250 individuals have contributed to these chapters from 52 countries. And, uh, you know, as it started out as, a, as an online platform really to redo this book, it expanded uh, so that beyond the academic, um, you know, chapter, which has quantitative information in it, um, to actually accessing the, the knowledge for application towards management. So um, a, a group of scientists also came together. They put knowledge to practice tools on there for decision-making around sanitation. Um, it includes um, a, both a, um, a mapping tool because we know we've got limited data on, on uh, emissions of pathogens and distribution of pathogens. So it uses uh, JMP data and global data sets to map where pathogen loading is important in the world. And um, it also has a tool on, um, on removal of pathogens uh, 
through uh, by building a sketcher of treatment processes and then optimizing treatment processes to actually remove viruses, remove bacteria, remove protozoa, and remove helmets so that we're looking at the whole array of pathogens that might be found in sanitation. In the virus section, there's nine chapters currently. Um, there's a summary of some of the new and emerging viruses and indicator viruses. Um, and each chapter in these books uh, you know, uh, for the pathogens includes some information on disease burden, global disease burden, of course, transmission, uh, important transmission routes, including um, links to food and, and shellfish detection methods, a summary of detection methods, but the bulk of it is focused on occurrence in wastewater. What do we know about how these viruses occur, what their persistence is, and how do we remove them through treatment processes, including disinfection? Um, and so uh, you can imagine that some, some chapters have a lot of uh, information and others not as much, but these chapters have all tried to be uh, each of the authors have tried to be, be very consistent <clears throat> in reviewing the best quantitative data and trying to provide information on what kind of concentrations of these pathogens would we see in sewage, in treated wastewater, in river systems, receiving wastewater or in seawaters and even biosolids. Um, you know, when we look at the data that's there, it's really a snapshot. Um, it's from the published literature this is from all over the world where scientists have worked with water utilities, gone in and taken a snapshot of what's in the wastewater uh, in time and space. So some of the studies are quite extensive. Um, we tried to include, um, the group tried to include studies that had you know, um, significant numbers of samples, but it's still a snapshot in time. It could be one year of, of sampling, uh, maybe two years of sampling, but only one wastewater plant here and there. Um, and so this is what we see with the rotavirus um, with percent positives at different times of the, of the year in these, when we take a snapshot. And of course, we've been able to look at, at concentrations. The same thing with some of the enteroviruses, um, looking at when it's present, but not as much, um, you know, a global picture of the various concentrations that might, might be found in these various parts of the world over time. So now we're looking at a new virus. <laughs> and um, so I'm sure this audience knows quite a bit about SARS-CoV-2 and it's quite interesting how much uh, the conversations have uh, emerged around uh, with the general public around um, the science of the virus, its transmission, our ability to prevent transmission, and now vaccination. Um, and so it, it, it's quite phenomenal when you think about it. Um, late in, and now late in 2019, you know, is when this outbreak started making uh, headlines in China. Um, you know, by January, the Chinese scientists had isolated this novel coronavirus and designated it as, as a respiratory syndrome. And by February, of course, the disease was named by the WHO, CDC was involved. And by March, it was um, considered a global pandemic. So it moved so rapidly, both the science as well as the communication to the global world about what was happening. You know, this family of viruses is, is a very old group of viruses. Um, it's, it's got a lot of different viruses, 200 different hosts. In fact, we have actually looked for the common cold, uh, you know, coronavirus in wastewater on occasion. Um, so there's a few publications out there. Um, and it's, a, it's like, actually, it's very similar to polio virus in that it's an RNA virus. It's a positive strand virus. It means that it's very efficient at going into the cell and replicating. Um, but it's of course different from our enteric viruses in that it has this envelope layer with the glycoproteins. I think everybody you know, in the world has seen a picture of the, the SARS-CoV-2. Um, so the common cold was identified in 1932, but we've had several other outbreaks associated with uh, the emergence of new viruses in this family. Uh, SARS, the first SARS outbreak, which occurred in 2003 
It was it spread globally. It lasted only about six months, and um, it uh, you know it, we still see some of the original SARS, but it it, it didn't um, maintain its global contagious spread. The MERS outbreak, which occurred in 2012, was very large, but lasted a little bit longer in terms of a, a global pandemic. But it's very much still endemic in different parts of the world, the MERS virus. And both SARS and MERS, the original SARS, um, had uh, you know things in common with SARS-CoV-2. It spread around the world fast, quickly, um, and it, it caused a higher morbidity and mortality, more disease and more death than we were used to seeing with these types of viruses. And so we discovered that, um, you know, SARS-CoV-2 was also very similar to many other viruses in that it replicates in many different host cells. And it was discovered that it replicates in the intestinal tract. It doesn't normally cause diarrhea. Only two to 10% of the patients actually had any illness associated with its replication in the gut, but it was certainly detected in the feces. So the virus was known to be in the nasal barnal area, the throat, the, the sputum, the saliva, um, and then also in the, in the feces. Um, and it looked like there was prolonged viral excretion in the gut. It's not clear whether um, the gut, the, the infection can start in the gut and move to the respiratory tract like some of the Coxsackie B viruses. We think that mostly it starts in the nasal passages and respiratory tract and then we swallow the virus and then it starts uh, replicating quite efficiently in the gut. But um, we're still learning a, a bit more about that. Um, and then of course, knowing that it's in feces, we're gonna find it in wastewater. And in fact, early on, it was discovered in sewage, these genes, these very specific target genes in the RNA that were being um, sequenced and used for the clinical laboratory could be used in wastewater by the, the methodologies that we had used for other viruses. And so the international and global environmental virology uh, community just very rapidly within weeks were really up to speed in their laboratories using these new techniques, these new uh, approaches, these new sequences, this new understanding of the, of the genome of this virus to look for this virus in wastewater. It happened very quickly. So, you know, there was worry about uh, this virus uh, being um, infectious, of course, because it was so contagious uh, from a respiratory uh, transmission standpoint. And there was a great concern about its ability to be also transmitted through the fecal oral route. Early studies, and we're still learning this, it's, it's hard to cultivate the virus from feces. And to my knowledge, no one's cultivated it from wastewater to date. Now that may be that our, our, our culture systems for wastewater are not very efficient and that the virus is being inactivated and, and, and that there's a few infectious virus there, we're not able to capture those few. But we do have some understanding of some mechanisms that might be going on. Um, and so, so there's some recent papers also and uh, more work is coming out that the newly synthesized viruses as they were, are released um, are inactivated in the colonic fluids. Um, and so in the lower intestinal tract, in the colon, as the virus passes through there, we get inactivation of some of those spikes. But we don't know if it's total inactivation. We just know that we do probably have at least 99%, 99.9% in inactivation from these studies. And so uh, we're now looking at those labs that have BSL-3 laboratories, very specialized laboratories that can culture this virus and begin to understand a little bit more about its persistence and its inactivation. So, you know, we're, we've got all this uh, work, which we have called, you know, sewage surveillance, wastewater surveillance, wastewater monitoring, um, the first use of, of sort of saying we're going to use sewage 
in the epidemiological sense to inform public health actions was really kind of described in Feacham's book back in 1982, that original book that, that spurred on the Global Water Pathogens Project. That idea that what's happening in our community, not, for the, well, not what's happening in, with individual and you know this person, that person, but what's happening in our community can be monitored for using wastewater. Um, you know, in the, in the early 2000s, though, sewage epidemiology was actually expanding, and it was expanding not in the um, infectious disease arena, but was in, uh, expanding in uh, the arena where they were monitoring the use of drugs and pharmaceuticals in communities using sewage surveillance. So they used the word sewage epidemiology to look at, at, at drug use and use of pharmaceuticals. Um, of course, that uh, included, you know, and started including antibiotics and, of course, antibiotic resistance. But by um, 2015, this morph morphed into from sewage epidemiology into wastewater based epidemiology. And there was quite a lot of um, literature, uh, conversations, conferences. Uh, particularly within uh, the chemical societies, American Chemical Society and others, about monitoring sewage, about the ethics and a reporting out of the results and all of this kind of thing. Um, so when SARS came on a board and, and uh, you know, labs across the world started really monitoring uh, for the SARS-CoV-2, uh, you saw the environmental virology and the wastewater-based epidemiology kind of converge. Um, and so it, it, we've, it, we've become a bit bigger community um, in, in terms of the labs and the capacity and the various um, aspects of monitoring community health via wastewater. So yes, we're dealing with uh, this globally. You can see in these four panels, I, I took this um, I grabbed this April 10th, so a, a little while ago, a couple of days ago, this gets updated um, about a week later uh, from, you know, our, our current date. And um, so here in this top left panel, top left panel, you can see the worldwide cases on April 10th, 700, uh, 747,000. Um, in the United States, this other panel on the right uh, 58,000, almost 59,000 cases. And um, I, I picked uh, Illinois and Michigan um, as some examples here. Um, and we saw this first wave, of course, early. Uh, uh, you had a slightly bigger wave, uh, first wave uh, here in Illinois, you know, starting in, in um, you know, March and April, coming down in the summer, and then a second wave in, in November. Uh, you know, you can see the number of cases, um, the new cases, April 20th is, is 2000. And here we've got 6,000. You can notice the, the difference in the y-axis here. But, um, and then this third wave that Michigan has had that is quite, quite high. And it's just now starting to come down. We're just now starting to see it come down. You can see that Illinois had a slight increase, which might be a third wave, but it didn't peak up. Um, less uh, transmission, maybe more efficient distribution of the vaccine. Um, it, it's hard to tell, you know, what's the reason? There's a lot of questions like what happened in Michigan, right? What's going on there uh, with this third wave? But you can see that Illinois is starting to come down. And this is a, a closer look. Um, I just grabbed this from the 21st, a couple of days ago. And, uh, you know, watching this every day, just go up, up the daily cases. You can see this in this right panel. And then on the left panel, the, the concern really wasn't so much the cases, which was happening in some of our schools and our young people and in our uh, outbreaks in our, in our, some of our um, athletic groups. Um, but it was the, the hospitalizations going back up and to some extent, the mortality going back up. And we're just starting to see this little decrease here, uh, which is very hopeful. So 
what happened in Michigan? We had, we've had about three laboratories in Michigan that were doing environmental virology. Um, I, meant, I mentioned Irene's work, um, who'd been doing wastewater surveillance with, with the city of Detroit. We have been doing with some wastewater surveillance. But um, in addition to that, the state of Michigan um, has a lot of beaches and you can see we're smart, smack dab in the Great Lakes. We had developed a network of PCR laboratories um, for beach monitoring. So this advanced PCR laboratory network had started about 2015. The goal was to use a PCR and to train everyone using polymerase chain reaction for beach monitoring so that we could monitor our beaches and, and, and close them the same day if they were polluted in the Great Lakes. Um, and this network turned into a very quickly last year into expanded from about 15 labs to 20 labs into um, a wastewater surveillance network um, using the polymerase chain reaction. So at the wastewater plant, um, wastewater systems at the facility are pretty used to taking samples and looking at them for both biologicals and chemicals. And they have what they call automatic samplers. You can see this is an automatic sampler down here. Um, and, and, and they have it set up at the wastewater plant. It samples the wastewater over time and you get a sample. But in the sewer shed where you have to go to a manhole, and here we are in the winter, and here we are, you know, last year when there was no snow, um, just looking at how we're going to get samples out of the sewer itself, out of the sewer shed. So not just monitoring at the wastewater plant, looking at the whole community, but going into the sewer shed and installing these little samplers that then can take a sample every 15 minutes, every 30 minutes over a time frame to try to capture, of course, we're trying to capture the feces, right? So we want to capture those flushes <laughs> that come down the, the pipe, so to speak. Um, the, the other thing was um, advancing technology. Now, polymerase chain reaction, as I, as I mentioned before, it was a technique that just, um, you know, has had such dramatic impact on all aspects of molecular biology. In fact, the scientists won uh, the Nobel Prize for PCR. Um, and this polymerase chain reaction is what I always call a biological way to copy the DNA or the RNA inside, a, inside an organism. Of course, you can see it's very useful for viruses because with viruses, we can't always culture them. It's very difficult to culture. Uh, we don't always have the right cell line, um, or it may take a long time to culture. But with polymerase chain reaction, we have been able to sequence, get the sequence, uh, you know, um, in the in the community, and we can design then a way to copy the genes. Um, we're we're now using what, using what we call digital droplet or droplet digital PCR. Now this differs from quantitative PCR in that quantitative PCR, uh, we, we went from PCR, just presence absence to quantitative where we could get a, 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 an estimate of the concentration of the virus in the sample. So we, got a, we had a standard curve and as the fluorescence grew, as the replication grew, we could actually say how much virus we had. Digital droplet actually divvies out the sample it partitions the sample in all these little droplets, you know, up to 60,000. And we use what we call a most probable number, which is an old uh, statistical technique uh, to um, estimate concentrations. So it divvies out the samples. You can tell which droplets are positive, which droplets are negative, and you're able to um, uh, get a concentration of the virus. Now, why is, is DDPCR uh, gaining so much traction in environmental virology. Um, well, one reason is that we have less interference when we do the PCR in a little tiny droplet, if we divvy out the sample. So we know we have interferences with replicating or copying those genes. And so this, this definitely decreases uh, the interferences. And it gives us um, a more precision in quantification. 
from one sample to another. And this is a picture of what we get. We can see what droplets are positive, what droplets are negative, what droplets are uncertain. Um, we can do more than one type of target. So we can have one more, more than one type of fluorescence. And so what we're seeing is in environmental virology and in, in environmental samples in general, where we're bringing very different kinds of samples in from sewer samples to wastewater samples, all kinds of different stuff in that, as you can imagine, that this new advancement in, in the instrumentation has really helped in the environmental surveillance work. Um, we've um, been involved in a very large national study um, that, um, and, and here's uh, the, some of the Michigan labs all using the same methodology. We were able to show very good precision with our different labs uh, using these methods. And we were kind of smack dab in the middle of all the different labs. This was a, a, a trial where you got an unknown sample and it's been published, this reproducibility study has been published, uh, looking at the SARS-CoV-2 in wastewater systems um, and uh, looking at recoveries and all the quality control that you need. And so you can see where our network, and we are now looking at the 20 labs um, and how reproducible we are from for looking at, at a, a small community up in the Upper Peninsula to a large community like Detroit. Now I wanna just show you some pictures of some of the data. Um, we started monitoring, as I said, it geared up pretty fast, the, the network and the lab. So in some places, monitoring started in April, some started in May. It was pretty high in, in, in many of these communities and then started to come down and in some communities, you can see in this middle panel here, it came down, it was up on occasion, but it came all the way to negative. And we would see it pop up every once in a while, but it was down to negative. We saw a big outbreak in a couple of our, our communities, and then it went back to, to negative um, and uh, kind of bounced around, but stayed down through those summer months until we started seeing these higher increases in, um, early November um, increasing really throughout our state and in some places getting quite high uh, in some of the communities. Very reflective of what we were seeing in our communities um, where it was high in, in April as we started monitoring, came down, bounced around, but came down to zero. We saw an occasion, saw a little outbreak, down, 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 but then started increasing. And we are now just seeing the wastewater signal start to plateau and um, in some cases uh, start to come down. Um, and and um, uh, in, uh, depending on where the community was. Um, in addition, um, we were um, looking at wastewater at Michigan State University uh, we did a pilot in the fall where there were very few students, but a few students came back to campus and then began um, a, a more, um, a larger project in the spring. We also monitored um, the community wastewater because interestingly enough in our wastewater infrastructure, some of the East Lansing wastewater comes through our pipes to the wastewater treatment plant. So we could actually isolate locations that were buildings these little blue circles, and we could isolate um, wastewater that was coming from the downtown community East Lansing area. Of course, this made some news uh, in the summer as we opened back up our bars um, in Michigan and we did not have social distancing, did not have um, masks being used. And um, this was the wastewater signature. We saw this wastewater in East Lansing High in May, it came, started coming down, negative, 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 went way high in June, we're like, what's happening? Came back down, but then started um, spreading and, and being sustained. Then we started seeing it show up in some of the other wastewater um, communities. And as it turns out, this particular peak coincided with the um, outbreak event, the exposure that the health department um, identified, but the outbreak itself was not identified by the health department until June 23rd. 
So it was recognized as we started working with the, both the wastewater industry and the, the health department in a, in a collaboration that if we could get the results out soon enough, we could maybe have a leading indicator to what was happening in the community in terms of spread and um, in terms of, of um, potentially, hopefully decreasing. Um, this is what it you know, looked like. And here's the outbreak. It kind of maintained infection um, in the, especially in the East Lansing. It's, we started seeing it peak up in the other communities. This is a, a, another um, location we stopped monitoring. These were the two main communities and it finally you know, began increasing. It, you know, by September and October, well before our cases started increasing in these communities um, in the wastewater. And of course we saw it sporadically in the dorms. Now in the dorms, we were doing these little grab samples. I showed you that little bag we were putting down, getting the grabs. And then the spring we changed to um, these automated samplers. And it, we monitored six dorms. We have about 200 to 300 students in each of these dorms. They also participated in a saliva test. So all the students were taking a saliva test once a week. We were monitoring the wastewater uh, biweekly. And then of course we were still doing the disease surveillance uh, cases and quarantining. So cases in the red where there was a true positive through the testing, the PCR testing of an individual and the blue was people that had thought they were sick or thought maybe they had been uh, exposed to somebody that had COVID. So we're analyzing all these data now so that we can calibrate the wastewater signature um, in terms of our dorms um, to the cases, both asymptomatic and symptomatic cases to make decisions about how we're gonna to communicate to the students, how we're gonna support them when they get sick, how we're going to try to develop um, vaccination programs for the students that are gonna come back to campus. Now you may have heard also that there's reinfection happening with those that have been vaccinated. Um, some don't get sick, like 80% of those that have been vaccinated that get reinfected don't have any symptoms, they're asymptomatic. They believe they're still contagious. Um, some are getting ill though. So we're, we're very curious as to what's going to happen with the wastewater signature as we move forward with the vaccination programs, as we look at reinfection, as, um, and we don't know what the fecal excretion really is gonna be in these situations. We're also looking for the new variant in wastewater. Um, and you can see what happened. This is all the data on the dorms with the various students. 200 to 400 students. It turned very high positive early on and spread to the dorms. This light, light pink is a low positive. And then, but we had these really high numbers, 10 to the six. These high numbers happened when there was really early new infections. They tend to excrete a lot of virus. And by March, it, well, in February, we started seeing suspect positives for the UK variant. And, um, and by mid-March, um, we had positive UK variants and the most recent data in April, um, it's uh, the UK variant is, is throughout many of the dorms is found in the students who are infected. I'll just end by saying that um, there's a new group working together called the Wastewater Sphere. Um, this is a group that's looking at whether the global data sets could be put in one data center um, and inform um, in uh, public health environmental response. And um, we're working with, with Dr. Colleen Naughton at the University of California Merced. You may have seen her website, COVID Poops. And she's got an inventory of all the dashboards that are coming up where universities are monitoring and these universities are monitoring either their own campus or they're monitoring the community. So the, the academic world is very much involved in setting up laboratories and helping the global community. This is taking place in 53 countries and there's over 2000 sites that are being monitored. And this is happening, um, you know, every day this dashboard changes. So we're gonna, um, we're looking at, at public dashboards where we can bring the, all the data together. Um, we're gonna try to integrate these fields 
Um, of course, most of the dashboards are high income countries. So we're also working in Africa with some colleagues and collaborators that are monitoring uh, waste systems in, in, uh, that are non-traditional, septage tanks, lagoons, drainage ditches. Um, and we're working with groups that are gonna put use case studies up. How is, is wastewater surveillance helping public health make decisions and helping um, decide how we're going to use our resources for both monitoring and vaccination programs. Um, this is what our map looks like. It hasn't gone live yet. Um, we hope to go live in about a, a month. And um, we also are going directly down into the uh, country. Um, we have um, a time stamp um, where you can toggle and look at the changes, um, the total number of sites and samples that are being collected, and you can view trends, um, whether they're going up or down or staying the same over the last month um, at the various locations. So we're very excited about this. It's, it's tremendous effort because it's, there's, it's global. And these dashboards are being set up. We're trying to develop best management, best practices for dashboards. The Center for Disease Control is going to have a dashboard for the United States where different utilities are, are collaborating uh, with the CDC to have a, a national look at what's going on in the US. And of course, Europe is now doing that. We'll also have access when um, uh, appropriate when the uh, data is available uh, for download and for analysis by scientists. So I'll just end by saying, um, you know, wastewater surveillance is getting a lot of attention. And we do think that this is going to be an expanding um, arena, um, uh, you know, for many different uh, conditions in our communities. It can be used as, as a leading indicator or early warning of certain diseases or emergence of new diseases. People are using metagenomics to look at new viruses emerging. We are using new um, uh, modeling techniques so that we can calibrate the wastewater signature back to what's happening in the disease in the community. Uh, we could develop spatial risk maps. Um, we can target um, rapid testing programs. Um, people are, are monitoring nursing homes um, so that they can watch, um, you know, what's happening in a nursing home after they've been vaccinated through wastewater rather than swabbing all the residents um, every day or every week. And um, it's going to support the, the, tra the tracking of these new variants and, and new, and new um, pathogens. So I, I want to, of course, acknowledge all the, the collaborators uh, who have been uh, helping the Michigan Network, uh, Dr. Shannon Briggs uh, in the Department of Environmental um, in Great Lakes and Energy, we call it EGLE, our, our wastewater utilities, our public health utilities. And, and it's really not possible without this collaboration. Uh, wastewater is a public health, wastewater and wastewater treatment, as we've been as we've known for a long time and as discussed in the SDGs, is a public health um, a, a, you know, effort. So when we talk about wastewater treatment, we're talking about public health at its finest. And the wastewater industry and people that work in this arena that are working to bring sanitation are doing public health work. And so bringing sanitation, with public health and, and national health programs together with scientists and virology, virologists and laboratories and, and bringing the, the capacity of these labs um, up with this new advanced technology um, is gonna change the world we live in. And, and we'll be working globally really to address disease at, um, a, you know, at, at a very dramatic level. And it's gonna be very exciting. And I think we're gonna, we're going to see, um, you know, more of you who are entering the workforce working in this arena in the future. So thanks so much for having me here. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to talk about these issues. You can see that, you know, the, the group I work with, we're very passionate scientists about this, this area. So thanks so much. Thank you so much, Professor Rose. I wonder if we um, might um, pose a couple of questions to you. We're near the top of the hour, but if, if, if it's okay with you, would you be, be okay with answering a couple of questions from our audience? Of course. 
So I have one here. Um, could you please ex explain the methodology for the variant detection? When you showed the UK variants became dominant in March and April, were those data analyzed DTPCR or sequencing? So, so they've been analyzed both, but what's been interesting and in how fast it, it, you know, the technology and the science merge is that the sequencing took place very early on in the clinical specimens. And, and so they were getting um, information on the exact sequences of some of these variants, particularly in the spike gene. And once those sequences were known, some of these companies that we've been working with um, who've been providing kits developed primer sets that we could test and use with digital droplet PCR. So um, the sequencing was leading to the development of kits that you could use to get, and we could use it at the same time we were using, looking for the wild type. So we could use multiple fluorescent channels and we could get concentrations um, in the digital system. And so it, it, it was like mind blowing how fast it, uh, it happened. But you know we're gonna have to do both. And right now they're still confirming the PCR by sequencing. So sequencing led to the primer set development. Then with the primer set development, that is going back to sequencing to confirm. And ultimately we won't have to do the confirmation anymore if we, if we have the right primer set. But there's so many new emergent um, you know, strains. Um, I just uh, talked to Dr. D'Souza and she said, well, uh, the company said they have now primer sets for the California strain and of course the Indian strain. So the primer sets we have right now were UK and Brazilian. And now of course this California strain is, is emerging. The Indian strain is emerging and we're trying to actually come up with criteria that say, what's a variant of concern? Because there's a lot of different variants, but a variant of concern may be one that uh, evades the vaccine, is more contagious, spreads more rapidly, has higher morbidity or mortality. So how do we gather that data and say, these are variants of concern and we should be looking for them. And then there's gonna be the science piece where we're just gonna look for the various types of changes in the RNA that's taking place. This is quite amazing how fast it's happening. Oh, thank you. Now, a more general question on connecting the, um, the work on water surveillance that you're concerned with and the general issue of, of water quality and water security are you able to draw direct links between the kind of breakthroughs in water surveillance that you're involved in and you know, practical uh, improvements in water infrastructure? Yeah, so our, our K2P tools, especially the Sketcher tool, was designed to take what we knew about pathogen concentrations in untreated sewage. What kind of maximum concentration might we see, like with viruses? because we've used the indicator system, right? We've used E. coli for a long time to try to meet sanitation goals or even drinking water goals. And we're gonna to continue to use those indicators. But for treatment technology, to optimize treatment technology in lagoons and, and other alternative wastewater treatment, we need to address the viruses and the protozoa and the helminths. And so the Sketcher tool uses the data on surveillance in untreated wastewater and then looks at removal by adding another lagoon, adding aeration. Uh, some places can add disinfection, some places can't. So it's gonna be, you know, it's gonna be time. So the practical considerations, we've been testing these tools with like Uganda who has a national mandate to upgrade their sanitation. And then of course we want to, they, we want to work with the utilities because it's best utility to utility in another country to say, how did you do it? How did you use the information and the tools to make decisions on sanitation? So we are seeing it hopefully be a knowledge to practice type of um, implementation. Thank you. And I think I'll take advantage of my privileges as moderator to ask the final question. Um, I'm, I've studied uh, some of the 19th century history of epidemic disease, in particular yellow fever and cholera. And it's to the cholera, obviously, that we owe the very sort of institutions of, and traditions of public health, uh, the response, the global response to that disease. Um, and certainly the science, you know, as you've sort of dramatically, you gave us an historical sweep and you've showed how you know, 
dramatically the science has changed from the Broad Street pump uh, to today. Um, it didn't, it, as, a, as a more a social and cultural historian, I, it strikes me how many of the social dimensions of epidemic disease have remained stubbornly similar since the 19th century, that we still have vulnerable populations in, in poorer communities and there's still an awful lot of public misinformation and um, that leads toward uh, leads to panic and uh, and confused messaging and confused responses, which is you know, we very much saw that in the 19th century and we still see it today in 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 2020 and 2021 in, in dealing with COVID. So just maybe a final reflection from you, a zoom out reflection on how you see the the science and the social dimensions and how perhaps we can do better, you know, for the, in the next epidemic, uh, right. when it comes to manage, you know, having the science and, this, and the social response and the government response match up. Yeah, I mean, you know, like you said, both cholera and typhoid are iconic waterborne diseases that led us into the 19th century of where we are today in many countries. We already knew about that, but still we had that huge cholera epidemic that spread through South America and of course Haiti and other places we should know what to do right and so um, I really think this idea of articulating the SDGs that I think really made a difference not just that the Millennium Development Goal was a start but when we articulated the Sustainable Development Goal and we really put sanitation there uh, and, and, and a water goal and government started saying, and they started bringing in financial, the financial ministry into the water discussion, right? And I do think this whole discussion of one water, one health, the, the merger of this idea of water is, is, we're talking about one water and we're talking about our, our oceans, our fresh waters, our ground waters, and, you know, and the way we use water for food sustainability, for wellness, for beautifying our environment, for spiritual. We've got to bring that one water idea forward and link it to the one health because we know then the one health is about our planet, you know, these algal blooms, you know, destruction of wetlands, uh, changing our land use patterns, um, climate, of course, climate change, uh, uh, you know, on top of this, um, you know, and the health, the health of our ecosystems, like you said, and ecosystem services, the health of our animal world and, and, and our planet in general, and, 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 and of course, uh, the, and humankind. Um, and, and so I think we have to think more holistically uh, and the, this one water, one health idea. And we do have to start talking about how we're going to prioritize our uh, managing our resources and understanding the economic benefits of, of safe, clean water to the economic development of the world and to our health. Well, thank you so much for that, because that's a, a wonderful note to end our month long se series of lectures on on water, um, connecting one one water to one health to climate change, to social and economic security. Basically, the you know, as you said, the holistic view of the future of water um, and thank you for ending that on with such stir, uh, ending our our month month-long discussion with such um, a stirring call to action we really appreciate that and we've been honored to have you uh, close our our congress with that wonderful talk thank you well, thank um, you for inviting me i'd also like to thank our co-sponsors for congress in this event the joint area center the illinois global institute and the center for advanced studies a special thanks to our organizing committee, to Jim Best, to Steve Witt, Michael Silvers, Eric Green, and to um, research intern Paul Garzuzzi, and to all of our IC staff and student volunteers. And thanks to all of you for attending. Uh, this concludes our Institute for Sustainability, Energy and Environment Congress for spring of 2021. But don't look now, there's one in fall already in the planning stages just around the corner. Stay tuned to our website and our newsletter. We're already making plans for the fall Congress on circular food systems, which will take place on October the 26th and 27th. So please 
mark your diaries, your October 26th and 27th for Congress on Circular Food Systems. We hope to see you all um, then in October and before, and we certainly hope the fall event will allow us to convene in person. Uh, but for now, um, happy Earth Month and have a good afternoon and enjoy your weekend. Thank you.